We are in the middle of this series called Selah. And if you are ever familiar with like some of the older biblical translations, like maybe King James or New King James, I think NIV might even translate it this way. Probably should have checked that before I said it. But like when you're reading through the Psalms, there's kind of a typical flow to how some of these Psalms will go. Like the beginning of the Psalm will say, my enemies are chasing me. <laughs> it doesn't look good. I should probably give up. And then there'll be, in the older translations, like the King James, it'll say, Selah. Now that translates just pause or interlude. Sometimes it'll say harp solo, bling. And then on the other side of that pause, on the other side of that reflection, is kind of when David or the other psalm writers will go, you know, but my strength is in the Lord. The Lord is a strong and mighty tower. God, you alone are my fortress. Even though my enemies are chasing me, God, when you show up, it's bad news for them. And so that's, that's kind of, it's not, it's not a series about Psalms, it's actually a series about some of the bigger stories of David's life. And so what we're doing is we're taking the story out of 1 Samuel, and then we're placing the psalm that he wrote on top of that, that like the psalm is the emotional just reflection of everything he went through. The psalm is kind of the song that he wrote, if you will, about while he was going through that kind of experience. So that's the Selah. And I, I just know God sometimes does his best work in the Selah. Sometimes God does his best stuff when we stop and pause and give him room to work. Amen, everybody? So I don't know if you remember 2007 or not. It was a fantastic year for Brent and Jerry Kellogg. 2007, it was just, and so kind of the high point for us was our youngest, Kaylee. She was born in June of 2007. So if you're a parent, you just know the joy of holding that baby for the first time and, and was just, just a special, that was definitely the highlight of 2007 for us. But also, we were voted as the senior pastor of what was then Cornerstone Church in 2007. That happened in December. And so, you know, that, that was a big thing. But something really big kind of happened in 2007 that affected all of us. Does anybody remember the ice storm of 2007? Oh, do I remember the ice storm of 2007. Like, it hit Tulsa. I remember that night laying in our bed and it just freezing rain, freezing rain, just pounded all night long. And I don't remember what time it was, but it was somewhere in the middle of the night where the lights went, <laughs> you know, and you're like, it's about to get cold in here. So the next morning, you know, Kaylee, she's six months old. And I, 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 it's like one of those things as a parent, when you can close your eyes and you can go back there like it was almost yesterday. I can see her sitting on the love seat, and we had every bit of clothes on her we could fit. She's this six-year-old, just puffed up marshmallow, had a sock cap on her. She's sitting in mama's lap, you know, wrapped up in blanket, and she's squirming like doing what six-year-olds do. And it's like, it's cold in our house. And like, when you got a baby, that's a, that's a really big deal. And so my mom had built a house at Daisy, and, and if you're around Hill Spring, you, you know I talk a lot about Daisy. Some of you are like, where, where's Daisy? I'm gonna show you some stuff about Daisy here in, in just a minute. She, didn't, she hadn't moved there yet. She moved there in about 2009, but in 2007, she had built a house at Daisy, and Daisy's where she grew up, it's where my dad grew up, and so she had, and it was a house, it was a two-bedroom house at the time, and she kept calling it Granny's Cabin. Like, when I think cabin, I think of a place where you go rough it, you know, where there's an outhouse at back. And this was, this was a little bit plush for, for Granny's cabin. But anyway, she had this cabin down at Daisy. Well, Daisy hadn't had the ice. And Daisy hadn't had the, all that stuff. They just got some wet rain. And so I'm on the phone with her that morning. I'm sitting there watching Kaylee, the, you know, in all of her puffed up garb. And she's sitting in Mama's lap. And Mom, you know when Granny talks, you got to do what Granny says do, right? Especially in my situation. And so she goes, you get them babies down to Daisy. Like, y'all be careful. You, you load up and you just get them babies down to Daisy and you don't worry about your house. Electricity will be back on. But, but Granny can't lay here and worry about them babies being cold. You get them babies to Daisy. So she decided that she was going to stay out at the Kellogg Ranch at Talala. And so Jerry and I and our two kids, we loaded up the truck and moved to Beverly. We went to, we, to Daisy. And as we got on Highway 75 and we headed south, 
you remember? Like, it was almost like a war zone. Like, there were tree limbs broken and down and power line. It was just eerie. Like, nobody had electricity, and it was just crazy. And the further south we went for a while, the further south we went, the worse it got. And then after that, it, it kind of became less and less and less until you get down south of McAllister. It just kind of was wet rain. I mean, they hadn't had everything that, that we had had. And so, like Jerry's family, they had lost electricity. And then so we had some other friends that went with us. So by the time we all land at the cabin, there were 10 of us at this cabin, two-bedroom house, that we're going to be there for three or four days. Now, how many of you know 10 people crammed up in a house is fun for a three-hour birthday party? Can I get an amen? Three days is a whole nother discussion. <laughs> it's like, yeah, when there's just that many of you put in there, it just kind of starts to get, I was ready to go home. I was, I was ready, ready to go home. So maybe you don't know where Daisy is, and maybe you've been around for a while and you've heard me talk about Daisy. If you get on Highway 75 and just go straight south, you'll eventually, that turns into the Indian Nation Turnpike, and, and so you... You know, you'll go through Old Mogi, you'll go through Henrietta, you go through McAllister. And between McAllister and Antlers, there is one free exit on the Indian Nation Turnpike, and it's the Daisy Clayton exit. That's where my dad grew up, where my mom grew up. My dad's parents have a big cattle ranch down there, and so that's where my mom actually built her cabin. I, I spent my summers going to Daisy. I spent 95% of our holidays. If it's Labor Day, when we were kids, we were going to Daisy. We had horses and four-wheelers and Jeeps, and, and we had all of this stuff. Daisy is awesome. Daily, it, Daisy is my sailor. It's the place where I just get to go rest and relax. And so one of the ways that you'll know you're at Daisy, especially if you're coming north, like if you're coming out of Texas and you're coming back towards the Tulsa area, when you, when you get to Daisy, you'll see they at one point cleared out the side of this mountain and they took rocks and painted them white and they made, spelled Jesus up there. That's how you know you're at Daisy. It's a holy place, you know? And so it's just, if you've ever driven that, it's absolutely gorgeous. So I'm going to show you some other pictures of, of Daisy. Oh, that's, I took that last fall at deer season. We actually have a real cabin that's a hunting cabin that sits up on this pond. And so I love this pond. Like Landon and I will go up there. We got a little John boat. We'll go hill paddle around, and I'm fishing and doing all this. And so it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Here's another picture. It's just kind of the view. It's kind of up on the top part of one of my granddad's mountain, and you can just see he owns 90% of what you see. You just see this big, beautiful valley. It's in the fall of the year. The leaves have kind of already changed. And so I keep talking about my granny's cabin. I know you want to see a picture of her cabin, so let's put a picture of her cabin up. You can see it kind of there in the background, you know. Oh, so you want to see a better picture of it? All right, put the next picture up. There's a lot better picture of it. The horns, that's what I'm talking about. Killed my first deer this year. Landon and I were sitting in a deer stand. I'm reading. No, actually, I think he was reading his Bible, and I was playing a game on my phone, and he nudges me. Dad, there's a deer. I'm like, shoot him. He's like, I don't want to miss. All right, boom, Bambi down. Anyway, there you go. He is now hanging on my office wall. I'm giving tours after church. Now, <laughs> I love Daisy. Daisy's an, it's an awesome, it's an awesome place. It's, it's my, it's my sailor. But when you're down there for three days and like, it's just, it's constrained and there's people and like, I love going to Daisy. I love going there for the weekends. It's where I go rest and retreat. But there was something about December 9th and 10th and 11th of 2007 that I didn't enjoy Daisy that much. I didn't, I just, I wanted to be home. I wanted to be back. I wanted to sleep in my bed. And how many of you know when you have kids, kids do better in their own environment. Granny's house is awesome, but sometimes Granny's house is not baby-proof. And you're always having to watch the toddler and making sure she's not, you know, pulling pictures down off shelves and, and stuff like this. And so I just, we, we, it was great to be there. I love being there. I wanted to be there. But man, I'm telling you, after about two days, I was just ready to get home. I was nervous about my house up here. I actually made one trip back just kind of come check on things. Electricity was still out. And man, I was, I was just ready to be home. Have you ever been somewhere where you didn't really want to be, but you couldn't go back? You couldn't, you couldn't go home. Going home was, was not an option. And don't get me wrong. I was grateful for Granny's house. I was grateful that I had that. I, I was, it, it's awesome in the right season, in the right time, in the right place. And I, I love going to Daisy, but I just, I was ready to be home. 
That's the emotion that I want you to tap into. Maybe you've been on a vacation and your flight got delayed coming home or a business trip and you couldn't get home or, or maybe you were somewhere and you, you had to spend the night somewhere and you, just, you were just ready to be home. That's the emotion that I want you to tap into for today's Selah. Our story we're going to look at is actually in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And then if you want to put a thumb there, you can turn to Psalm 57. Because Psalm 57 is the song that David wrote about this story that we're going to talk about today. 1 Samuel 24. Before we get there, I want to just throw a quick scripture up on the scene. Because David had been running from Saul for about three years. He'd lived on the run. He'd lived as a nomad. He'd lived in this place and that place and this place and in that place. He'd lived in a cave. But something unique begins to happen while David is running from Saul. While David's alone in this isolation, he starts to kind of collect a crowd, if you will. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1, it says, So David left Gath and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble or who were in debt or who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. So David's living as a man on the run. He'd been here, he'd been there, he'd been here, he'd been there. But as, everywhere he went, he, he picked up these guys. Some were in trouble with authority. Some were in debt. The most of them were just discontented. And I think that's an interesting name. That's an interesting label that, that the scripture gives them that they were just discontented. Contented, and you'll see that discontentment in the tension of our story today. There was something about this group of soldiers, these group of rough guys, that they didn't make the cut. Now, that's kind of a sports term we use today, and we, we use it in all different contexts, but, but it's kind of a, a sports term. And so, there's some leagues, some sports where they limit the number of players and athletes that you can have on your roster. So a coach sometimes will have to cut an athlete. And if you don't make the roster, you didn't make the cut. One of my favorite movies is a movie done by Disney. It was about the 1980 hockey team that we had been terrible at hockey for all these years leading up to it. In 1980, they hire a guy by the name of Herb Brooks, and he has a different coaching philosophy. And, and the, the name of the movie is called Miracle. And it really was. Like, it was crazy that he took a bunch of former college kids, that, and he won the 1980 Olympic gold. It's a great movie. It's, it's an awesome movie. But probably the most tense scene of the whole entire movie is when Coach Herb Brooks is sitting there at his desk, and in comes one of the hardest, best-behaved guys that just worked his rear off for that team, a guy by the name of Ralph Cox. And so they, they could only take so many players. They had one too many. Assistant coach comes in and goes, Ralphie, coach needs to see you. And he knows. Like The movie does this great job of just showing his facial expression, and, and he goes in, and you need to see me, coach. I said, man, you're a great player. You've worked your heart out. You've given me everything I ever asked for. Man, you're a, you're a great player. I wish I could keep you. In that moment, Ralphie didn't make the cut. It's tough. Golf, I don't know if you guys are, are golfers, but they will start on Thursday and Friday. It's a big field of golfers. Like everybody can, can get in, so on and so forth. But on Saturday and Sunday, they cut that field of players significantly. And every golfer's goal, obviously, is to win. But if I'm not in position to win, I at least want to make the cut. And so if you're not in the top portion of those, you don't make the cut. This morning, I want to talk about don't make the cut. Today, I want to look at don't make cuts. So I want to jump to our story in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. If you've got your Bible, you can, you can look there. 1 Samuel 24, verse 1 says, After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 Elut troops from all of Israel, and he went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. Okay? Now, most theologians believe that Samuel wrote the book of 1 Samuel, give him credit for writing part of 2 Samuel. However, he actually dies in the middle of of 1 Samuel. So it's kind of crazy how they do that. But but when I read this, 
It sounds like Samuel is from Daisy. He says, so, so he, he sent his men from all of Israel, and he went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goat. So this is how we give directions at Daisy. You know, you're going to go past the big pine tree, and there's two dogs that will start following you right there once you pass that pine tree. And when the two dogs stop following you, take a left. There'll be a bull standing there at that fence post. And when you take a left right there, you're going to be at the rock of the wild goats. That's how we give directions at Daisy. And it works. People just get there. So verse 3. At the place where the road passes some sheep folds or some sheep pens, Saul went into a cave. To go to the little boy's room. To relieve himself. I love God's sense of humor. It's throughout scripture. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now these are the moments in life that will get you. What do you do with this? Is this coincidence? Or is this God ordained? Like did this just happen? Or did God orchestrate this moment. Is this just luck for David or is this the Lord? Now, I totally believe God has got the whole world in his hands. I believe that. I believe he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. But I, I think sometimes we are so strongly looking for God to affirm and God to validate what we want, that sometimes we're looking for God in everything. And I know he's everywhere, and I, and I, I believe that God's in control. But sometimes there is something that I want so bad that I'm looking for God to, to just affirm it. Let me, let me give you an example. Like you wake up one day and you say, you know what? I want to go fly airlines. I want to be an airline pilot. Well, can you fly? No. But you know what? I woke up this morning, and when I went outside, the wind was blowing. And you know what it takes to make airplanes fly? Wind. It's God, bro. It's God. That's his way of telling me he wants to go be in a... Or, 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 or these, you, you've heard some of these stories. That might be a little, little extreme, but you've heard some of these. Like, it's God's will for us to get married. Really? Really, it's God's will. Yeah, 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 bro. Check this. This, this, this. this just blew us away. Her grandma's middle name is Anne, and my great aunt's name is Anne. <laughs> bro, it's God. It's God telling me to do that. And I'm like, ah, I think that's the burritos you had for dinner last night, you know? We all know somebody that has so strongly wanted to be able to say, God is doing this. God has done this. God is doing this. And this very thing actually happens in this story with some of David's discontented men. Let's look at verse 4. Saul's in the, in the cave. Don't want to get a visual of that. But Saul's in the cave, and he's relieving himself. And so some of David's men start to whisper to him, Now's your opportunity. David's men whispered to him, Catch this. Today, the Lord, bro, this is God. The Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and he cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. Now remember a minute ago, I talked about the men that had collected with David. He's a captain of 400 men. Now some of them were in debt. Some of them were running from authority. But these guys were discontent. Tinted. It's not a, not a high quality character of person that's running with David. These guys are running from life. They're running from something. They're, they're a little bit disgruntled with life. They're not out at this cave in the wilderness of Gedi because that's where all the good jobs are. You know what I'm saying? The best opportunities that life has to offer are not in the backside of a wilderness. And so these discontented guys are probably getting a little bit tired of living on the run. They're probably getting a little bit tired of sleeping in caves. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for the caves. Don't get me wrong. I was grateful. I love going to my mom's cabin. But sometimes I'm just ready to go home. Sometimes I just want to sleep in my bed. And it is so easy to take moments like this and take coincidence and go, Bro, this is God. God told me. We love playing the God told me card. 
And here's why I think we play the God told me card sometimes is because how can you argue with God told me? <laughs> he said, let there be light. Boom, universe was created. He got that right. He told Noah, go build a boat. He got that right. So how can you argue with God told me? I don't think it's coincidence. I, I really don't. I think God orchestrated this situation, but not for the reason that these guys are thinking. I think, I think God's trying to prove himself faithful to David. I think he's trying to test David. I think he's also going to use this story to humble Saul in this moment. And David's discontented men who were tired of living on the run, they were tired of living in a cave. Do it. Kill him. Now's your chance. God told me it's okay. Bro, this is God. I don't want to go too far down this path because I don't have time to jump into it, but you might be careful when discontent people start talking for God. Hashtag just saying. You know what I'm saying? So verse five. Then David's conscience began bothering him. Remember, he, he crept up while Saul was, yeah, and he cut off a chunk of, da- of Saul's robe. But David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. I'm, I want to read it in a couple of different translations. The New King James said, Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. I love the King James Version. It says, His heart smote him. <laughs> that was the last time your heart smote thee, right? So there's some interesting conversation about this. Like, how did David, how was he able to get down and sneak up and, and crawl up on Saul while Saul was doing that? And then secondly, when you think about why would you do that, that's just gross. You know? And so kind of the conversation is that Saul, most likely when he goes into this cave and he takes off his outer coat or his outer robe and he probably just chunks it in the corner and then he goes off to another corner and he does his business. So, so a lot of scholars think that David snuck over here and he cut off a part of Saul's robe. Now, if you want to believe that Saul's squatted down over here and David was ninja enough to come and cut that, you, you're not theologically wrong. Like scripture doesn't tell us, well, Saul's coat was laying in the corner. You, if it'll help you sleep at night thinking David was that crafty that he snuck up, it's okay. You can do that. But I want you to understand the context of what's going on. Saul's doing his thing and David goes over to his robe that he had thrown down and he cuts part of it off and then his heart smote thee. His heart starts troubling him. Verse 6, he said to his men, the Lord forbid that, that I should do this to my Lord the King. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for he, for the Lord himself has chosen him. And now at this point in the story, and it, it doesn't say, but the scripture, the text, strongly implies how David's men respond. David said, listen, not like this. Now, I, it's, not, it's not my place to touch the Lord's anointed not like this. And so when you look at the next few verses, it's almost like one of David's men goes, fine, if you're not going to kill him, I will because I'm ready to go home. I am so tired of living on the run. I'm so tired of sleeping in caves. I'm so tired of working this hard. So David, if you don't want that blood on your hands, put it on mine. I don't care. Let the guilt fall on me. I'll kill him. Verse seven. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. No, guys, not like this. Listen, God has promised that someday I will be king. God anointed my head with oil through his prophet Samuel. I know deep down in my spirit that someday will be my day, but not like this. Don't don't make the cut. And that's the story. 1 Samuel chapter 24, those first few verses, if Saul goes into the cave, David cuts his robe, that's the story. David processes this whole story through a song, as he would do many times. The big moments of his life, he would write a song. He would write and talk about the tension and the strain and the pressure that he was under. He would pause, reflect, Selah. And then we talk about how God showed up. So I want to I wanna lay, that's, that's the story for Samuel 24, but now I want to lay the Selah on top of that. How David processed the story when he finally got to sit down with his harp and write the song. Psalm 57, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. I look to you for protection. 
I will hide beneath the shadow. David's hiding in a cave. God, I hide beneath the shadow of your wings. It's a miracle that Saul didn't discover them when he went in. It's because God was hiding David and his men in the shadow of his, his, until the danger passes by. Verse two, I cry out to God most high, the God who will fulfill his purpose for me. He will send help from heaven to rescue me, disgracing those who hound me. Selah, pause, reflect. So when I look at just these first three verses, and when I look at the story in 1 Samuel chapter 24, there's a couple of cuts that you and I in our life, we are so tempted to make. And this morning, I just want to encourage you, today, it's a good thing. Don't make the cut. Don't make the cut. I'm not talking about the roster. I'm not talking about golf. I'm not talking about the masters. And there's, lot, there's things in our life that we're so tempted to cut. And today, I want to look at these two cuts that we're so tempted to make. The first one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Is man, don't cut people. You might even want to add another word. Don't cut people down. Don't step on somebody's head just to elevate yourself. Don't, don't cut people. And let's be honest. In that moment, David could have killed Saul and no one would have blamed him. I'd have done it. Tell you what, if we come in walking like that, tell you what I'd have done. You all know that person. If you don't, you are that person. Nobody would have blamed him. Dude, you're running from your life. You haven't been in your own home in three years. And let's get real. David really didn't hurt Saul. But in that moment, the Spirit of God began to convict him. He was smote in his heart. His heart was troubled. His conscience was bothered. Something about the Spirit of God said, David, you went too far. His conscience began to bother him. Just because he cut the corner of the king's robe, Like, that seems like such a insignificant deal. Really? Doesn't seem like it's all that big of a deal. But here's the truth. In a way, he cut away at who the king was. In a way, he just embarrassed the king. Think about this. Everywhere Saul would go now until he got back home or could get his robe fixed, he's walking around, there's a big chunk of his robe missing. Dude, what'd you do to your robe? Well, uh, David cut it off while I was... Wait, what? David did. You saw David? What'd you say to him? Did you see David? Now, what? Say that again. David did what? David? Well, David cut it off while I was going. David cut it off while you're going to the bathroom? <laughs> hey, guys, check the asshole about his robe. This is awesome. In a way, Saul had to tell the story of why his robe is missing this big chunk. It's embarrassing. You're the king and you were going to the bathroom and David cut off your robe. But we do that. We do that to people we don't like. Or we do that to people that aren't in our inner circle. Sometimes we cut away at their character. We cut away at who they are. We're negative about them. We gossip about them. We gripe about them. We complain about them. We cut them down. And this is one of the things that I love about David and all of his stories. You never see him talk bad about King Saul. Even when David has allied himself with Saul's enemies, David never talks bad about King Saul. He still says, he's my king. Even in this story, he's my king. He is God's chosen. David may have cut the corner of his robe, but he never cut away at his character. Sometimes we do it just to make ourselves look good. Like we have this internal comparison thing going on. Well, yeah, they're, they're successful, but blah, 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 blah. So sometimes we're, we're, we're doing it to, to make people look bad in the eyes of others. We do it because we're, we're playing this internal subconscious comparison game. And so we just, we chip away at everybody else. We cut everybody else down. But sometimes there's something else at play. Sometimes there's something spiritual at play. Sometimes it's a maturity issue. Let me show it to you again in Psalm 57, verse 3, he will send help from heaven to rescue me, disgracing those who hound me. And see, this is where I make my mistake. This is where I think a lot of us here, we, we make our mistakes. We don't trust God. Like, he got ahead, and, and he's successful, but, but God, you, so if you're not, not going to cut him down, God, then I'll do it for you. 
God, if you're not going to level the playing field, God, he cheated. God, he doesn't go to church every Sunday. God, they, you know. And so, so we just don't trust that he's got the whole world in his hands. And so we decide that we'll step into that role. And, and since, since God's not out there telling everybody what a bad person this is or how stupid this person is or blah, 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 then we step into that role. And here's the deal. We don't rest in the assurance of God. We don't. We just don't think God's going to be fair. We don't think God's going to deal with it. When Paul was writing to Christians in the city of Rome, in chapter 12, he says, listen, this is where you're headed. If you're a Christian and you're maturing and you're on this journey, let me give you a picture of what your life ought to look like. If you're a growing, maturing Christian, these are some things that you need to have in your life. Verse 19, dear friends, never well, but you don't know what she did. You don't know what he said. You don't know what. Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God for the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay them back, says the Lord. See, when you refuse to cut down other people, even if they're chasing you, even if they're the reason that you have to live in a cave, it says something about your character but it also says something about your faith. It also says something about your spiritual maturity that I have lived long enough with God, even though the critics surround me, even though the idiots are attacking me, I'm doing what God called me to do. I'm doing the best that I can to be the person that God created me to be. And they may hurt me, but I still trust God. They, they, they may talk about me, they may gossip about me, they may be stupid, but I still trust God to deal with them. It's not my job. It's not my job. I'm not gonna cut people. I'm not gonna make that cut. And so fortunately for David, that still small voice, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God convicted him in that moment. David, you went too far. Don't. Leads us to the second cut. Don't make the cut. And that's don't cut corners. Now, if you're 24, 25 years of age or younger in this room, I really want you to lean in for just a second. Like save Instagram for a little bit later, okay? I really want you to hone in on, on what I'm talking about because listen, don't cut corners. For the best part of three years, David has not slept in his own home. David's kids have not been in their rooms, playing their Xbox, playing their Fortnite, not playing with their toys. They've been on the run. This is not an ice storm where you go to Granny's cabin for four days. This is three years, three years of David living in a cave. And in one moment, he has a chance to end it all. And I know what most of us in this room would do. Pastor Matt's on vacation. He's off doing what Pastor Matt does on vacation. But if he was here, like if this was Pastor Matt in that cave, first of all, you could hear him laughing, you know. But... I just, like, when I, when I put Matt in that scenario, I see him grabbing a metal folding chair, coming out in his pro wrestling, like, under thing, you know, and trying to do some WWE me, you know. <laughs> Bill Shalaki was there. I think he would use some of his Native American Jedi ninja stuff, you know. If sweet little Cassie that was up here singing today, if she was in that room, she'd be like, you guys hold him down. I'm going to tickle him <laughs> till he can't breathe anymore. I think, I think every one of us in that situation that David was in, if you're given the opportunity to end your running, if you're given the opportunity to end your suffering, to end your displacement, to end living in fear, I can go back home now. We all would have killed Saul in that moment. David, Right now, you can end living in a cave. You can stop this madness. He and his discontent men could have slept in their own beds. That very day, they could have headed home. That night, their kids could be at home playing with their toys in their room. But David didn't. The story tells us that David made his decision. I'm not going to kill Saul. And then he had to restrain his men. Because you know there was one, let, let me at him. I don't care if this is wrong. I'm tired of living in cave. And David says, no, 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 no. 
but I just want out. I'm, I'm tired. In this moment, David took a lot of self-control, not to kill Saul himself, because you know he had some anger. You know he had some frustration. He took a lot of self-discipline to say, I know that someday God's going to make me king because he told me he was going to. He sent his prophet to pour oil and anoint my head. I know it looks like this moment is God-ordained. I know it looks like God did this, but something doesn't seem right. God anointed Saul to the position of king, and it's not my place to change that. If God wants Saul dead, God's able. If God wants to remove Saul from king, God's able. If God wanted David to be king, God's able. And in that moment, David had to trust the timing of God instead of the temptation of that moment. We live in a culture today where everything is instant. Instant coffee, instant popcorn, that's okay. You know, instant microwave brownie, Instagram, instant, instant, instant. Everything, everything's, everything's instant. And so in our culture today, we've developed this idea that everything should be easy and instant. Listen to me, young people. I'm sure to tell you, if you do everything easy and instant, you won't be good at anything. Some things, you just have to put the work in. David, in this moment, where he could have the thing he wanted. He could have the crown he was waiting for, the thing he felt like was never going to come. How can I be king when I'm living in a cave? But he makes the decision. Not like this. Not, not like this. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy who became king because I killed the last one. Not like this. See, people won't respect me. Now, they won't blame me. Dude, I'd have killed him too. But, but there would just be something missing in the level of respect that people would have for me. I know someday, I know someday God's gonna make me king. He told me he would. I believe it in my heart. But not like this. I know that someday I'm gonna get married. I know. I know, I know someday that there's gonna be this true covenant, connected love, and we're gonna have these romantic moments. I know that someday my heart's desire will be fulfilled. But if I cut corners today, it's gonna to cheapen the promise that God has for me tomorrow. I know someday I'm gonna get the job. I know someday I'm gonna get the promotion. I know someday I'm gonna to get to live my dream for a paycheck, I know. But I'm not gonna cut other people down so I can get there. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna gripe about the competition. I'm not gonna gripe about my coworkers to my boss. Not like this. Someday I'll get ahead, but, but not like this. And we live in a culture that wants everything fast and easy and instant. And we wanna cut corners to get there. But when you cut corners, you make happen in your own time in your own ability, the very thing that God wanted to give you in his time and his ability. And this is what I've discovered about God's way. It's so much better than mine. When God wants to do something, it's so much better than what I can make happen. Let me show you David's confidence in that. Psalm 57, verse two. I cry out to God most high, the God who will, not might, but the God who will fulfill his purpose for me. And what God brings to pass is better than any door I could kick open for myself. And what God brings to pass is any better, is better than any corner that I can cut. And it's better than anything that I could create for myself. God said, let there be light, and he created a universe. With one word, with one phrase, in one moment, God can fulfill his purpose for my life. Don't cut corners. Don't give in to the temptation that might be squatted down right in front of you. Not like this. Don't cut corners. Listen, 44 years old, and I've cut way too many corners in my life. Young people, listen to me. 
every corner that I cut, I now regret. Every one of them. We live in a generation that cuts corners. We don't want to do anything the right way. We don't want to do anything God's way. It's too slow. It's too boring. I kind of need to figure it out for myself. I kind of need to try this first. Like we live in a generation that I want to play like I'm married now. I want to do what married people do now. I want to feel those emotions now. But we are also living in a generation that is absent of God's blessing on our lives. Every adult in here will tell you, yep, I cut corners, and now I regret it. I fully believe this. If David had taken advantage of Saul's vulnerability, if David had killed Saul in that moment, he would have still been king. I just, I just don't know that God would have blessed his kingdom. I just don't know that God would have made that everlasting, I just don't know. But I do know David was a man that did things the right way. David was a man that did things the necessary way. David was a man after God's own heart. Don't cut corners. Not like this. Selah. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon on the Hillspring YouTube page. If you enjoyed it, take just a second, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single video. For more information about Hillspring, visit our website at hillspring.tv for times and location. We hope your faith was lifted and your life has been inspired with this message. Thanks again for watching.